Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Transfer Portal CFB podcast and YouTube channel presented by No Context CFB. I'm your host, Dylan Rubin King. Joined today with me today is Liam Blutman, Mr. No Context CFB himself. Liam, how are we doing, man? Sup? Doing good. Guess what, Dylan? What? I don't know why it took you eight hours to say what. <laughs> the college basketball season's over. It's true. I'm out of hibernation, essentially. Yeah, back in action, back in black, yeah. even though you're wearing white. Yeah, go Penguins. Um, I will be back in hibernation, kind of, because the draft, but still here. And there's college football, not really soon, but there's Pretty spring soon. games, and that's there are spring games happening. Well, games, and then you could be like UCLA and just have nothing. Or Kansas State. Yeah, like that, that stuff's happening. So there's a lot to be excited about. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, today to top it off, you know, we're going to talk about the magazine a little bit if you haven't heard. And, you know, if you haven't heard what is wrong with you, where have you been living? Uh, we're working well, on a college football. Pre- the, yeah, probably waiting for, for this episode to hear about it. The college football season preview guide that we're working on is just about three months away, July 5th, $9.99. We'll have in-depth previews of all 133 FBS conferences, teams, uh, previews, awards, interviews with players, coaches, all sorts of really good stuff that you're not going to want to miss. Um, so again, July 5th, $9.99. It'll be digital for download, uh, for purchase, of course. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that. We'll also give some of our players uh, that we're looking forward to watching this year, some guys that are on our radar. Um, so stay tuned for that as well. But first, of course, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Leave a comment if you'd like. Um, give us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you find us give us some love. It, it does a lot more than you might think it does. Um, and of course, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. You can find those in the description on YouTube. Um, so thank you everybody for tuning in. Let's start off with the the magazine. So Liam, why don't I kick it to you? What have you been oh. working on for the magazine? Oh, I've been working on some stuff for the magazine. And I'll tell everyone who subscribes in the next five seconds, I'll even like throw in an exclusive offer for anybody who subscribes by the time I'm done speaking here. I will bake cookies for. And that'll be an experiment because I don't cook or bake or nothing. I eat food. Magazine. That's cool stuff. Um, I, uh, gosh, what am I doing? Uh, I spent the last like eight years of my life researching. You can't call them fun facts. You could call them facts and team's mascot history and, uh, you know, school colors and all that stuff and just, you know, nickname origins and all this crazy stuff. For all 133 FBS teams. And when I tell you it might have taken a few years off my life, I, I mean that. Well, it's a good thing. That's okay. We don't care about that. We only care about the 133 facts. There's a lot of them. Really interesting ones, sad ones, cool ones, stuff. Um, Boise State, I wrote way too many words about Boise State for the upcoming season. Because they're going, I mean, they're just a super talented football team. And I'll highlight some guys later in this pod. What else? Um, Brennan Award stuff. There's that. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Doing stuff. Ohio. Yeah. You know, Curtis Rourke, man, comes back healthy for this upcoming season. And Ohio's going to go. Very far, very far. So, yeah, excited to write about Ohio. Talk about Roar coming back from injury. Should be one of the more interesting storylines for me this year. Uh, yeah, I don't know. What else? You. Yeah. Um, the magazine has been taking up pretty much 90% of, of my day. Uh, trying to make it as magical as can be. Uh, of course, with the help of so many people like Liam. Um, you know, this thing is going to be fantastic, but a lot of it so far has been, you know, trying to get interviews with a lot of guys that, you know, you guys would want that you guys would find interesting and, and maybe you don't know about. 
um, and are trying to learn more about through their their football journey and their upbringing, childhood, um, and just kind of their overall game. You know, why you should learn more about some of these guys. Uh, that's really what we're all about at the Transportal CFB. Uh, what we've been about since we launched is helping college football fans learn about the guys that deserve recognition just as much as the Alabamas, the Georgias, the USC's, all that good stuff. Um, you know, we have some guys, we've got some interviews with big school guys, but of course the little school guys as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but yeah, for me, I've been working a lot on, you know, like I said, landing interviews, I'll be doing the magazine layout as well. I've got some teams I'm writing about mostly checking out Kansas, Florida state and Fresno state right now. I believe New Mexico state is another one I'll be checking out here really soon. Um, Oregon State's in the mix as well. I'm covering them for the magazine. So a lot of teams, a lot of interviews that we're hoping to set up. Um, you know, feature stories are going to be coming soon. Those are coming into fruition. So so get excited for all that good stuff. It's going to be a jam, jam-packed magazine. I, it's we, we try not to call it a magazine because when you think of a magazine, it's like, you know, Sports Illustrated. It's 60-something, 70-something pages, but this is a guide. Like, this is more of an almanac type of thing it's going to be about 360 ish pages um full of pictures full of insight all the talented uh work that our team creates all into one uh culminating project so definitely keep an eye on that um did i miss anything did we cover everything uh oh yeah nfl draft stuff i should mention that there will be nfl draft 2024 stuff so that's going to be a very early look um into into what the 2024 draft could look like as well we're gonna put this out in july 2024 draft is in you know the spring of 2024 so in july of 2023 we're gonna be hitting you some knowledge and that'll be really fun to track how our kind of projections do and everything yeah some other things to look forward to we got some fcs content hbcu content previews uh, team rankings, some players to watch, all that good stuff. Um, like we mentioned, Brennan Award, watch list, award watch list, all conference teams, all American teams. Um, we'll bring back the all names team for the magazine as oh, well. Yeah. Um, I'm very, very excited for that. Already gotten a little bit of a jump start Charlotte. on that. Charlotte, hey, if if anybody is a Charlotte 49ers fan or you know, just as a fan of the American conference or college football, you got to tune in and check out their, their roster because their roster is full of some dudes who have some awesome names. So that's going to be a fun team to, to look through this year and watch and see what guys, uh, you know, make go viral for their names because there's a few. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much going on with, with the magazine. There's so many more things that I didn't even mention that are going in there. Um, but my pitch to you, if you're listening or watching uh, on your respective platform, shoot us a DM or a comment in YouTube um, and let us know what stories you would like to see. We're, we're still working towards uh, getting some interviews with players. Um, it's, it's very much a fluctuating process right now. So if you have any stories of football players, primarily at the division one level, but of course we're hearing, we're willing to hear some, some pitches through other levels as well. Um, if you've got any ideas for stories that you would like to to see in the magazine, please let us know. Um, anything that you don't want to see? I mean, I, I don't know if there's <laughs> if there's anything that college football fans are like, no, I've had enough of that. So, you know, just just give us your pitches. Um, you know, we are coming really soon on the magazine, but uh, like we said, things are fluctuating. So, um, we'd like to hear what the fans think, what you guys think. So, yeah, hopefully that covers everything with the magazine. Yeah, I'll even give you uh, a fact of one of the schools right now, a huge sneak preview of one of the 133. Actually, I was going to just do, okay, should you, like, tell me which school to do? Or, Would you like that better? Does that is that more enticing? I, I maybe. It'd be crazy if you chose the one I was going to choose, though. San Diego State. I was going to choose Virginia. Oh, San Diego State's kind of boring. <laughs> yeah san diego state is kind of boring um so san diego state on september 25th of 1930 they played the san diego marines in front of over 5,000 fans it was san diego state's first night game they won 39 nothing 
since that day, over 75% of the Aztecs games have been played at night. Whether it's on the home or the road, they just have a night game tradition. It is very weird. Those fellows just don't be playing in the day. I mean, I learned something that I didn't know before. Yeah. I was going to say That's the whole point. Which Virginia's? Okay. Original school colors, silver, gray, and cardinal red. That's what they called them. Silver, gray, weird kind of name. The colors didn't stand out, though. And that was noticed when they were playing on muddy football fields. They're like, this, this isn't, this isn't working. This ain't cutting it. So there was a student movement to get them changed. And at a meeting in 1888 among students, one of Virginia's star athletes and a football player was there. His name was Alan Potts. This guy was wearing a scarf. He got it at a summer boating expedition at Oxford University. It was blue and orange. One of his friends pulled the scarf off of him, waved it in the air into the crowd and said, how will this do? And that's how Virginia got their school colors. All right. Again, learned something I didn't know before. Yeah. So a lot of um, random facts like that, which are fun. Is that is the guy who was wearing the scarf? Is he in like the Virginia Hall of Fame because of that? I don't know. He should be for that alone. Like regardless of what he did on the football field or whatever sport he played, that that should be the Hall of Fame worthy and it's on its own. Yeah, I suppose he uh his scarf that he got on the summer boating expedition uh, expedition is still paying off in a big way right now. It should be like in a museum somewhere in like the college football yeah. hall of fame or something. Dude, but like there's just so many instances where all these schools just they lose track of these items and they lose them. Like Oregon and Oregon State just lost the platypus trophy and then years later just found it in like the, the pool facilities or something. I was like, yeah, we got to take that back. That's ours. Yeah. I was researching rivalry trophies too. And that was a weirdly common uh, theme. It doesn't make pattern. any sense. Yeah. With rivalry trophies, they just, oh, we lost it. And now we just got to go without it. Like, it, I don't understand who's in charge of holding these? Like, why wouldn't you put it on display? And, unless do, it's and just a like recycled thing. They, like, get it on display, but then sometimes it'll get, um, it'll just get stolen and, or just misplaced or something, and then they just don't keep track of it and lose it. And, I don't know, Hawaii and Wyoming lost their trophy and then had to recreate it. Yeah. From like a, I, I think I read about that one. Wasn't it from like a like a low quality image? They had to recreate create it. Yeah, yeah, and they had to try their best to make a replica of it. Yeah, stuff like that, or maybe they just get lost in the mail. Thanks USPS, because we we all know we all know how that goes. But um, I don't know. I, I think stuff like that's really interesting, and even the San Diego State one I thought was interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's not just going to be about your, you know, your depth charts, who's coming in, who's, you know, who are some guys to watch. Of course, we'll have stuff like that. But, you know, we're trying to teach you something about these teams as well. Um, you know, the 2023 side of them and even historical. Um, so, you know, the team spreads we will be releasing kind of a mock of one of the team spreads pretty soon. So you can uh, see what to look forward to with each team preview, what that'll look like. Um, but they're going to be absolutely jam packed. Like, of course, we're going to have the essay that talks about the teams and what to expect. But, um, you know, of course, their schedule, the results, some freshmen to watch, transfers, um, you know, milestones to watch, all kinds of interesting stuff. A lot of stuff that I'm forgetting, betting information, um, stat rankings. I've been doing a lot of that recently as well. I forgot to mention that I had an insane headache for like a week straight because I was looking at nothing but stats for all 133 teams. So I'm in a similar ballpark with you, Liam. It's going to pay off, but it was just nothing but staring at stats and numbers, and my brain kind of exploded over the weekend. But it's it's going to be worth it, trust me. Like it, There was a lot, a lot of hard work across our entire team that's going into this. Um, and it feels like, you know, across the board, it's really getting started because our first drafts are being written as we speak. Interviews are being conducted as we speak. Um, so this is prime magazine season. It's all happening right now. And we can't wait to show you everything that we're working on. So July 5th, 999. Follow us on Twitter and YouTube. 
and everywhere that you can find information about the magazine because it's coming very, 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 very soon. And July 5th sounds like a long way away, but when you're working as hard as we are, it sounds like, oh my God, we don't have enough time. But yeah, it's going to be fun. All right. So speaking of the magazine um, and some of the players that we're highlighting, um, you talked about Boise State as some guys that you're interested in um, highlighting. So who are guys that you're looking at at Boise State since you've taken a deep dive into them? Well, I tried like going more under the radar for this one and truly a breakout. So I'll name some other names first. I mean, that's the thing though. Boise State has so much just incredible talent and freak athletes and they're replacing a lot in defense, especially the secondary, but I mean, you know, there's any experience. We'll see who breaks out, but Ashton Jonti at running back, dude. You know what he did in the spring game? What's that? He had a 20-yard touchdown run. He had a 62-yard touchdown run. He had a 75-yard touchdown off screen pass. I th- I also, I don't know how many times he, like, touched the ball or anything, but that pops off the screen. It's uh, no secret that Ashton is... He he's truly going to be a superstar and he's an NFL running back and you know knew that pretty early on into his true freshman season last year. But man, like you're gonna see with Boise State's offense, there's gonna be some Kyle Hand Kyle Hanahan, Kyle Shanahan philosophies, especially in the running game. So Ashton's gonna be working in kind of an NFL running scheme and he's going to pop off. You look at He'll he'll have to like take touches away from Halani, but what are you gonna do? Then you look at DB Jalen Clark, just a freak. We'll see who where he plays, whether it's corner or safety. He's got so much potential. Jambre's Dubar is going to be a true freshman. He hasn't stepped on campus. Um, three star recruit, and I don't know how. Uh people don't be watching or knowing what they're talking about. This guy looks like an NFL running back, and we're going to see that very early on in his career. When you look at a guy like him, with his size, his build, I believe he's six foot, and he's got impressively powerful legs, and his leg drive's insane, and the strides that he takes, he just looks like he's an NFL dude. So you've got him and Ashton in the same backfield. That's scary. And then the other, like, honorable mention for Boise State is another true freshman. He played, though, in the spring. I believe he had two catches for 57 yards or something. Um, Prince Strawn. You might say, Strawn. Oh, cool. I know the name. Yeah, you do. Because that's Mike Strawn. That's his name from the Bahamas. Indianapolis Colts seventh round pick. No biggie entering his third year in the league. That's the good stuff. This is little brother Prince. And Prince might just turn into a king. That fella started playing football in 2019. And he looks the part already. His catch radius is massive. I, 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 did I mention he's six foot five? Did I say that yet? No, I don't he's six. He's six foot five, and Boise State fans, like the true diehards, are losing it on Twitter, trying to figure out how this team keeps him off the field as a true freshman because he brings something to that receiving game, to that receiving room, and that offense that they could so desperately use a red zone presence, a downfield menace. The Prince Strong's going to be a stud. Um. So yeah, before I. Ramble on about Prince Strong, Boise State guy that you should really expect a breakout from is Sei Oladipo. I don't believe there's any relation to Victor, but I didn't research that. Um, I, okay, so maybe he's like a cousin or something. I don't know. But he, he's received a lot of praise in the spring. Uh, their safeties coach, Kay Nione, expressed that Oladipo has stood out thanks to experience and versatility. He's going to play safety, corner, nickel, He's been watching from the sidelines the last few years, taking in every bit of information that he can and just studying and watching J.L. Skinner and watching uh, Caleb Biggers and Tyreek Jones and seeing what they're doing on the field. And he's been analyzing each and every bit of it, just waiting for his opportunity. This is his chance. Uh, Ione states that he believes this is one of the better coverage guys on a team, and this secondary is no joke. 
He's going to be a really good ball player. He's 5'1", 195, had an interception last year, five pass breakups. Say Oladipo could really become a household name at the group five level. I'm sorry for rambling so much about Boise State, but yeah. Oh, and Oladipo had a, a really good game in the Fresco Bowl. Um, yes. Like he was phenomenal. I think he had 10 or 11 tackles. Like I, I, I felt like I heard his name a ton in that game. I believe um, that was his first start. I could be wrong, but that game yeah. provided an opportunity for all these guys I'm expecting. All, like this Boise State defense, this secondary, like Jalen Clark and Old Depot, that game provided an opportunity for those two and a bunch of other inexperienced guys to get on the field in a bowl game atmosphere and play meaningful college football right before they're about to ascend in 2023. Absolutely. That does wonders. Yeah, yeah, and I know you talked so much about JL Skinner and you know the impact that he had on the football field, and I think he started to become a household name, um, you know, before last season, I would say. Um, and he just, you know, it feels like that's a really big player to replace, but it seems like they've got a lot of talent, a lot of really um, promising guys that can that can back him up um, and step in next year. So, um, yeah, Boise State's always a really interesting team. Um, even if they don't necessarily have like the household star power that, you know, you're used to seeing a decade and a half ago, but they're searching you know, for that icon. Absolutely. And it sounds like they've got a couple guys on the rise to, to keep an eye on. Um, I'm not really going so much under the radar. I don't think this guy's ever been considered under the radar in his life. Oh, I'm no. talking about Corey Foreman. Um, he's not a guy that, you know, obviously is a under recruited guy. He was the number one recruit in the nation. Okay. He went to USC hometown kid, uh, from Corona, California dude is a monster when he's on the field, but he's had some injury problems. And then even when he is on the field, just wasn't super productive. Uh, only 24 tackles in two years, four and a half for loss, two and a half sacks did have an interception against UCLA. Um, so that was fun to see him get a hand on a football and, um, Mm. you know, and make some plays. I know. Sorry. Um, I'm really looking forward for a breakout year for him because it feels like he's kind of an afterthought now. Mm-hmm. Um, they they need a guy to step in, not necessarily in the same position as Tuli Tuli Pelotu, because you know he was more of an interior guy. Um, but it's just someone that could get after the quarterback consistently. Because um, honestly, on the on the roster, I'm not sure that they really have that uh, with the departure of Tuli and Corey Foreman can bring that if he stays healthy and he stays on the field. Lincoln Riley's talked super, super highly about him, saying that he's a completely different player from who he was 12 months ago. Um, and he's staying healthy. He's Scary on the field. Thought. Yeah, and he's 6'4", 235, um, got long arms, just a really talented, quick, explosive guy. Um, you know, he could really make a name for himself in the Pac-12 um, and in college football this year. So I'm really excited to see if he can really put it together for the first time in his college career. Yeah, I mean, he – he has an opportunity here to, to like, he has an, there's not, from an NFL draft perspective is, is what I'm trying to say. Not many people are talking about him or aware really of the talent that he might, if he puts his talent all together and like truly, you know what I'm saying? What I'm saying, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up words. I'm sorry, I'm scrambling here, but. What I'm saying is Corey Foreman could easily w- w- easily work his way into the first round of the 2024 draft. He could easily be in that talk. This is a guy that with a big year is going to be looked at as probably a top 15 pick because we know the pedigree that he has had for how many years, and now he's put it all together here as a junior at USC on the national stage at a school where there's going to be so many eyes on their offense, and then people are going to be looking at their defense be like, show me something. You, you, or you, you, or you. Someone step up and show me something. If that's Corey Foreman, his brand takes an astronomical rise. Well, you you absolutely know the, the Alex Grinch uh, story about, you know, their offense can do no wrong, but, you know, in those big games, in those big moments, can an Alex Grinch defense step up? Uh, Mm -hmm. head to toe like they had a really solid defense last year when it came to forcing turnovers they had a plus 22 turnover ratio which was by a mile the top in the country but that was also because they took a really good care of the football on offense um and so they have that um you know going into next year but 
you know, can they actually, you know, prevent you from getting to the red zone and getting, uh, you know, scores down the line? If you remember the Cotton Bowl, and we all remember the Cotton Bowl, that defense couldn't stop a nosebleed against Tulane. Tulane looked like superior to a USC team that we all thought, you know, was only a couple of plays away from going to the playoff last year. Um, and Corey Foreman is a guy that absolutely needs to be a difference maker. It kind of reminds me of of this time last year when when Justin Flo was healthy. Um, and we were, uh, I saw a lot of people that were saying if he's healthy, he could be a first round pick. I remember seeing some mocks after last year's draft. People were putting him in the first round. And I kind of thought that was crazy because at the time he had only played two games in his career. Um, and one of those, he had a monster game against Fresno State. But, you know, the the injury history is a concern. Um, I know it's early in his career, but it, it, it was a concern. Um, and then just the production level for Foreman uh, isn't consistent either. And, of course, they had uh, a lot of talented guys on that defensive line. And now he's got a chance to to really be the guy on the defensive line. So I'm excited to see what he can bring um, in year three for USC. And I, I got to give him props because – a guy of his talent and his abilities to not really have the production and the playing time that he did at USC. He so easily could have walked out the door and said, you know what, let me get some playing time elsewhere. I'm sure I could walk right in and get a starting job at another power five school. And he stayed home. Um, And I, that's really admirable in today's day in college football. I wouldn't have blamed him if he jumped out and said, Hey, let me explore my options here. Let me see if I can get a starting role elsewhere. But the fact that he stayed home, stayed loyal to USC, um, really says a lot about his loyalty and um, what he's after. And I, I think he can be a big piece to the USC team as a whole. Yeah, he'll have a, a kind of signature moment this season where he, in a big situation in the fourth quarter, you know, maybe SC needs a stop and they're down and they need to get KO the ball back or they're up and they're trying to seal the game. And, you know, let's say they're up four and they can't allow a touchdown here and what, what what's going to happen basically is Corey Foreman's going to scream off the edge he's going to explode and he's going to absolutely annihilate a poor a poor quarterback and that's going to be a signature moment he's going to do some sick thing I don't know he's probably going to put the sword in his like you know do the sword celebration I don't know he's, he's, he'll have a signature moment I guarantee you. I wouldn't be surprised if he had two yeah Shall I uh, bounce off and, and talk about my next one, or did you want to um, go back and forth? Back and forth. talked about, like, five guys. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, I did do that. Uh, still, okay. Uh, let me, okay. I'll just go quickly then. South Coast State, tight end, you might say. Okay, yeah. Tucker Craft is gone. Oh, remember Dallas Goddard? Oh, yeah. Just a little tight end factory here. You're right, and they already built their next NFL tight end, Zach Hines. How tall is he? Oh, six foot seven, two sixty. Twenty nine catches last year, three four hundred. Okay, numbers are tough. Three hundred forty seven receiving yards, four touchdowns. He's the guy at South Dakota State now. Without Tucker Craft in the tight end room, he will split receptions with the Yankee Twins. But what can you do? Hines is going to have a really good year. He really decided to stay and compete for another national championship with just Bray Admiral because he was on the NFL radars. So you're going to see him there, South Dakota State, again, crushing it on the FCS level. He's an NFL caliber tight end with the monstrous frame. He moves well, has decent speed, just tough to tackle because Dylan, you know how hard it is to tackle a six foot seven, 260-pound behemoth of a tight end that moves very well and is stronger than – um Name a strong person. Either of us combined. Oh, that's Most not likely. saying much. That's not saying yeah. much. Stronger than the world's strongest man. That's how strong Zach Hines is. And and he's he's gonna be like a key part of their red zone, whether it's just as a blocker and setting up big time runs. South Dakota State loves around the power, uh the just the power run. Um We'll see how Hines does there. He'll probably do very well. I like him as a blocker and as a receiver in the red zone. You'll, he's an impressive catcher in traffic, and Zach Hines is his name. So have fun watching him for years to come. Well, I'm glad we're talking about tight ends now because I'm going to bring up a tight end myself, and we're going to offer another sneak peek into the magazine. I'm going to talk about 
Florida State tight end Kyle Morlock, who transferred from Shorter University, which is a Division II school. This kid is also 6'7 and 245 pounds, maybe not as physically, uh, you know, he's about, what is, what did you say, 265 was for Heinz? 260-ish, yeah. Yeah, so maybe not as, uh, I mean, you're, he's still 6'7", 245. Like, we're not trying to compare here. This guy is still a monster. No, pick apart the 15-pound difference. What was it? But what's so interesting about Morlock is this kid was 6'6 in high school playing receiver when he started. He didn't play tight end until he got to Shorter University. Said there were a couple of times, um, you know, when he uh, got started in college football that he got put on his butt uh, because of the he just wasn't used to blocking so much and being up front on the line of scrimmage. Um, You know, he said it was quite the adjustment, but, you know, he was an all star tight end at Shorter at the Division two level, all American both years. and now he's at Florida State. When he entered the transfer portal, he was one of the hottest names in the transfer portal. And I feel like a lot of people were learning about who this kid was, um, you know, after the outstanding uh, career he had at Shorter. But he got so many Power 5 offers out of the gate, chose to go to Florida State. Um, so one the, the sneak peek here, we I talked to him for the magazine. That'll be in the magazine. Um, what I learned about him, and I'm not sure if I should share this, uh, just yet, but it, it's it's too interesting to pass up. He grew up a Florida fan with, because both of his parents grew up Florida fans, and he ended up at Florida State. He said his mom is completely on board with it. She's totally fine. He said his dad is a little bit harder to convince um, of the transition to Florida State. But um, one thing that I loved learning about Kyle was the role that skydiving has in his life. He His dad is a huge skydiver and got him – uh, into skydiving as a kid. He said he was afraid of heights growing up. And he said, you know what, let's go skydiving. Um, and he said it's his favorite hobby now. His dad was, um, you know, huge into skydiving until uh, he he suffered from uh, a stroke and was on um, was in the hospital for a while, had multiple brain surgeries um, and had to kind of relearn how to do everything. Um, and just recently was able to go back on his first skydive um, so that was a really awesome story, getting to learn about Kyle, his love for skydiving and, uh, you know, his awesome family and his support as well. Although, you know, the Florida State, Florida thing might be still taking some getting to used to. But, you know, on the football side of things, strong, physical, the wide receiver talents uh, pop off the screen and just that pedigree of, you know, running routes and the explosion out of cuts, uh, his hands. I mean, it, you can definitely tell he's a wide receiver in a six seven two forty five pound frame. Him and he and Jaheim Bell are going to be fantastic at tight end for Florida State. That offense is is just not going to be fair. No, it's it's a disgusting offense. And you know when I highlighted Warlock for predicting the portal, yeah, I was wrong. I I went with Wisconsin, but I ain't mad. Florida State's a very good landing spot for him, and he, you know doesn't have an extreme amount of weight on his shoulders, right? Because like you mentioned, he still is playing with Bell. Like he's not going to be this unanimous tight end one in that offense. He's going to have a massive role in the red zone and in the receiving game as a whole. Imagine having the guard, he and Johnny Wilson inside the 10. Yikes. Uh, But yet, like you mentioned, Morlock's like wide receiver background just makes him a menace at at tight end and the things that he could do, the mismatches that he creates, the catch radius that he possesses, his movement, his lateral movement was the like first thing I I noticed when I started watching him. He's he's as smooth as butter, Dylan. Yeah, absolutely. And it like a yards after catch guy too. He just won't go down. Um, you know, he, he's one of those guys that when you hear him, when you're going to watch him at Florida State, you're going to hear the announcer say constantly, he stays on his feet. Yeah. Um, and he's just he's just a guy that just keeps on chugging. And, you know, at 6'7", 245, he kind of brings an element that Jaheim Bell doesn't necessarily because they he is 6'4". They complement each other so well. Absolutely. And then you got Johnny Wilson out here who's just a complete unicorn. And, uh, you know, they just have so many huge targets. Like we're talking about Jaheim Bell as if he's tiny in this offense and he's still, what, 6'4", 6'5"? He's going to be just fine. So look out for – I mean, everybody's talking about Florida State and deservedly so. But Kyle Morlock is a guy that I think deserves a lot more love and uh, attention because he was an absolute star at shorter, mm-hmm. um, had 446 yards on 30 catches last year, six tutties, had five tutties the year before. Um, 
career 15.6 average yards per catch, which is really impressive for a tight end. So I'm excited to see what he can do moving up a number of levels. I mean, going from you know Division two to the ACC to Florida State to a mm-hmm. program that has so much hype going into this year, more than they've had since you know the Natty days, uh, the college football playoff days with Jameis Winston. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a really exciting time to Ugh. see what their their offense looks like. I had a weird Sorry. thought here. No, I had a weird thought. This is for young for young college football fans. It's going to be like the first time going into a season where Florida State has a lot of hype. That's yeah. weird. Isn't that weird. Yeah, that's pretty weird because you know college football vets, you know people that have followed it for so long. Florida State, it doesn't even really feel like they were down for that long, does it? No, but, just yeah, making like fun of them a good bit for some downward swings, but they're up now. Unless you're a Florida State fan and you had to live through the Willie Taggart days. Um, I feel for you, by the way. Um, those days probably felt a lot longer than the what we're making them out to be. Yeah. But they're in they're in really good hands now. Year four to Mike Norvell is gonna be fantastic. Yeah, and with Morlock, just my last thing to touch on is he's the type of guy that you're going to see play in the ACC at Florida State, and you're going to say, How on earth was he playing for short? What? Uh, how does a guy this good play at that level? And yeah, he, he's transitioning from receiver to tight end. Whatever you get into the he okay. If he was entering the NFL out of shorter, I can't tell you how many people would just be absolutely in love with him as a day three pick. Just he is exactly what a lot of people look for in a tight end. A, a, it's a receiver like skills, man. Like that background just pays off in dividends. And I won't I won't go too deep into it. Like we got more names to share. So well, you know what else they're gonna say when they watch Cal Morlock on TV? This guy looks like Jim Halpert from the office because he has he's gotten that a ton. When I finished that interview, the communications person that I was with, I like as we were wrapping up and she was taking over the laptop, she was like, I think that's the first interview you've done where nobody mentioned that you look like Jim Halpert. And I, I was like, I'm not going to say it. It's already been said. Somebody mentioned it during his introductory press conference. And <laughs> if you look at his picture, like, wow, he looks like Jim Halpert from The Office. So that's another thing people might say. But anyway, I'll let you move on to who you want to talk now about. Now I need to I need to, to look. And, and, you got to look, man. I'm telling you, it's crazy. Like a young Jim Halpert right. from The Office, like season one, season two. It's insane. <laughs> okay, yeah. The, the hair might yeah. need a little working on in this That's poor true. state picture, but yes, the comparison is there. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, I'll kick it off to you to talk about football stuff instead of the office. Yeah, probably. Uh, okay, I'll go with my defensive back. I'll, I'll go with my other defense back. So I had a defense, offense, defense, offense kind of thing here. Minnesota DB Justin Wally patrols safety like a good center fielder, just making good defensive plays out there like he's Willie Mays Hayes on the baseball field. It's 5'11", 185, three interceptions, two back, two pass breakups in 2022. It's really hard for me to say pass breakups. I don't know why I messed that one up more than I misspell restaurants while I'm texting. And he had, he had seven pass breakups in 2021 as well. Big time ball skills, plenty of range, as I said. The way that he's able to patrol and just make these covered ground, really good closing speed. He has super high intelligence. He's just a very intellectual player. He has NFL ran all over him. And he's going to stick around in the NFL for years to come because of his innate intelligence, the intangibles that he brings to the table. He reads the quarterback's eyes very well. He'll be. He might not get – that's why I kind of went with the under radar route because that's what I like and all, but he might not get that hype that he deserves this season. What are you going to do? We're not going to act like the only good people that get drafted are in the top 32 or 64, 68, whatever. Like, if this guy is, let's say, a round three, round four player – a lot of mistakes were made. It is what it is. But Justin Wall, he's going to show up and he's going to show people I should have been up there. Well, I am him. And what's going to happen this year, just like for Corey Foreman, Justin Wall, 
No one, let me pull up their schedule too. I'm going to predict the game and we're going to clip this and we're going to come back to this. Okay. Well, let, let me just, let me just get this going. Right, Justin, the drum roll. Yes, drum roll. Justin Wally will have a game ceiling interception. Uh, okay, well, let's not say Ohio State. Yeah, oh, yeah, let's go with this. Game ceiling interception at Wisconsin. Or versus Wisconsin, sorry. Versus Wisconsin to close the season. Picks off Tanner Mordecai. Justin Wally, game setting interception. All right. Yep. Well, that's a, that's definitely a clippable moment. We'll have to see if it happens. But yep. um, And Drewster will have a great reaction that we see on TV. Yeah, he's Hollywood now. Shout out to Drewster. Um, yeah, I mean, Minnesota's defense, I, I feel like it kind of gets overshadowed because Minnesota didn't have a great finish to the year um, after starting out so hot. But their defense was like top 15 in every category. Uh, one of the only defenses to be able to do that. And Wally absolutely was a star for them. Um, I'll go to defense as well. Kind of not really under the radar guy. I mean, again, I'm, I'm kind of going big school here. Um, but Michael Williams is a guy that we've clearly put a lot of investment on because he or in investment in, however you want to put that. Michael Williams is a guy that we're investing in, yep. period. He is on the cover of our magazine. Um, and he is just, he was just a freshman last year. I think that kind of shows what we believe in his talent. And, you know, me personally, he was a guy that only started two of the 15 games last year for Georgia. Um, but he was a guy that just was everywhere on the field. Like, even if he wasn't making, you know, the sack and recording the statistics, he was still getting hurries. He was still, you know, making things tougher for offenses, which is just the name of the Georgia game. Even if they don't get sacks, even if they don't get deflections, even if they don't get TFLs, they're still going to make your life a living hell trying to gain yards and move down the field. And he's no different. He is no exception uh, to that. He is absolutely uh, a physical specimen. He was a guy that showed up in the postseason when it all mattered the most. I believe he had three quarterback hurries in the championship game. Um, he's just an absolute menace. And I want to see what he can do with an increased role. Um, I, I had a feeling he was going to do a little bit more, get more starts last year, but they still had some experienced guys that were stepping in once there's all those NFL guys left after the 21 year. Um, and so, you know, they, they didn't really need anybody to step up on that defensive line. But now I really think that he's a guy that's, oh, that's completely earned the opportunity to be a number one, you know, edge rusher for, uh, for Georgia. And this is, you know, this is a guy who was a really highly touted recruit at a high school. Um, I mean, he's just, he's an absolute menace. And at six, five, 265 pounds, hometown kid from Columbus, Georgia. Um, again, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Trayvon Walker and the fact that he doesn't put up a ton of stats when you look at stats, if you're someone who's super heavy on that, whether you um, you know, use that to make your decision on if they're going to be a bust, if they're going to be good at the next level, I feel like these kind of defensive linemen who just make things tougher, it's so hard to, to just use stats because their impact is so much greater on film than in the stat book. And Michael Williams, I, I do think he's going to have a really good statistical year, but I think his impact um, on film is going to be so much heavier. And I, I just... I can't wait to see him have a huge monster season. I, I wouldn't usually predict guys who already have a lot of hype coming in, but I'm, I'm really expecting him to be one of the best edge rushers and period defenders in college football next year. Yeah. Michael's the type of guy that we're going to see go viral on Twitter at some point for something that it's not even going to be like for a sack or a tackle for loss. It's just going to be for something like kind of funny, like something where He's just absolutely towering over someone and like he's the big monster or and he's going up against, you know, like weaker competition and the guy guarding him is like way smaller than ever, something or he's matching whatever. Like there's or, or there's like four offensive linemen on him at one point. There's gonna be some instance this year where Michael goes viral for something funny like that. And I'm very excited to see it. You're just gonna throw some offensive lineman like ten yards down the field because yeah. that's just what he does. He just has that well, power and that strength. I mean, here's the Georgia thing: if we're not gonna do a sack or a tackle for loss or something, and let's exclude that. 
He's just gonna line up a fullback and dive over the pile for a touchdown. <laughs> Please at six five two sixty five. Yeah, oh, I mean, there Lord. it is. I would absolutely love to see that. I don't. I don't think Kirby Smart would would do that, but well, let let's let's do it. I mean, a new offensive coordinator. Maybe they're like, hey, let's try this. Um, I mean, like they've done it with Jordan. They've done it with Jalen. Was it time for Michael? I actually forgot that they did it with Jalen. I remember them doing it with Jordan Davis. I don't remember them doing it with Jalen actually, but yeah, maybe I'll eat my words. Maybe we'll see Michael Williams lining up at fullback and. You know, Goodness. running over an entire defensive line. I, going I, into the end zone. I don't even want that. I want ball on the ball on the five yard line. I want Mike Kellen at fullback or, or maybe a little off offset. And I want him getting downhill. And like you said, doing it to an offensive lineman. I want this to a defender. May okay, I would actually feel so bad if there's a world where a poor safety fell victim and he's just annihilating a defensive back and throwing him into the hedges. Like I feel bad at that point, but that's why I want to see is Michael at fullback five yard run play hand off to whoever the running back is at that point and let Michael go downhill and bulldoze somebody. That's why I want to see. I'll do you one better. So same situation. Let's say it's like <laughs> third and goal at the five. Uh Oh, play direct, direct snap. Oh, direct, direct snap. snap. Yeah, just let him get some space. Like you said, run downhill. Give him a little juke action. You know what I mean? And just let him do some work. See what his legs can do and see what he's uh see what the elusiveness will do. You know how much I wonder how much um stock that scouts and like head coaches and stuff put into stuff like that, um, in their evaluations of defensive guys. Because like I know Noah Sewell had a, a rushing touchdown against Colorado. It just makes me wonder. Um, you know, what those guys like if they look at that and say, Hey, let me add this to our evaluation because he's got like speed, he's got quickness, he's got power. Like, can we add that to you know what we're bringing him onto our team potentially for? So, if Micah Williams gets the ball at you know on a third and goal at the five yard line, direct snap, look out, and if NFO draft scouts are going to explode, look out, okay. 2025 draft. I have to go for my last one. With the Maction man. But he ain't in the Mac anymore is the thing. You know, I, I go to Kent State. And I could go with my guy Dante Cephas who's going to be cooking with Drew Aller. That's going to be a disgusting, disgusting quarterback, wide receiver duo, especially with the, the steps and his development that Drew's going to take. But I think I have to go with the one and the only Devontae Walker. From, that Kent State offense was so lethal. People really don't get it. They didn't appreciate it. Devontae Walker, six foot three, one seventy five. We'll be playing in North Carolina this season. You might uh, say, "Oh, Drake May is their quarterback. That's fun. Heisman candidate. He's going to be a trendy pick. Probably going to be the number two quarterback selected in the twenty twenty four draft. Really fun stuff." Drake May, you might not know because UNC has run that guy so much, much like they did with Sam Howe. Drake May's got to throw the football. That's where Devontae Walker steps in. What did Devontae Walker do last year? I don't even want to say his stats first. I want to say, okay, I do want to say stats. Against Georgia, what did Kent State put up a fight like nobody else did? I would go out there and say, next to Ohio State, Kent State. Kent State had the most impressive performance against Georgia last season, and I don't think it's relatively close. Kent State was in that game. They were battling. Devonta Walker had a 56-yard touchdown off a screen against the Georgia Bulldogs defense. Seven receptions, 106 yards, and that one touched him. He did that against Georgia when he was playing for Kent State. He did it in open space up the sideline. He's now at UNC with Drake May in an offense that likes to put up points, explosive, a lot of downfield passing. You're going to see Devontae Walker is going to blow up a, a lot. He had 58 catches for 921 last year, 11 touchdowns. He was a big part of the flash fast offense. Superb speed, incredible strides. He makes up so much ground so dang quickly. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. 
I, I want to say he has a track and field background. I could be wrong. I'm like 73.9% sure. I could be wrong, but I'm like 73.9% sure that he's got a track and field background. Very good ball skills. His tracking ability is incredible. No pun to the track and field thing. He's just got really good tracking ability. And he's tough. He ain't easy to tackle. He's got really good movement. He is a Sunday player, and I knew that from probably the second ball I saw him catch at Kent State last season, that he had Sunday running all over him. And what he's going to do with some guy named Drake May in 2023 is going to be so much fun. Um, I'm not like, I mean... I don't know. He's just going to he, – he, to the moon. Devontae Walker to the moon. That's what the kids say. And confirm Devontae Walker has a track and field background from 70. North Carolina, actually, in Charlotte. Yep, 73.9%. Sure I was on that. The analytics of Liam do not lie. Yeah. And you can take that to the bank. I'm actually going to go with the Mac guy as well, who's, who's currently in the Mac. I'm kind of going rogue here because this isn't a guy I wrote down. I figured this – when you said Mac – I was thinking this might be the guy you were going to talk about, but he doesn't even count anymore because he's in the ACC. He's Hollywood now. So I'm going to go with Burt Emanuel Jr., a quarterback at Central Michigan. I don't believe he's got the job completely nailed down. I think he should. But what he did in limited time at the end of last season was nuts, dude. As a true freshman, had one start, played in four games. I think he led Central Michigan in rushing yards per carry. Like he was a mythical honor. beast. He was, he, he was like, it was like a, a a folk hero. It was unbelievable what he was. The the weather started to snow, and it became the the calendars turned to winter. And Bert was just like, "Yeah, I'm here. I, I I'm the Night King. This is my time." And he went nuts. If the name sounds familiar, Bert Emanuel, his dad is a. Uh, A former wide receiver in the NFL in the late 90s, played for the Falcons, Buccaneers, a few other teams as well. Um, So if that name sounds familiar, that's why. Uh, But Bernie Manuel Jr. did not play wide receiver. He is a quarterback with a ton of speed, only threw the ball eight times last year. Okay, so as a passer, has a lot to prove. Was four of eight, 54 yards. As a rusher, though, had almost 500 yards in four games, and 293 of those were in one game against Buffalo. He went 24 carries, 293, three tighties. One of them was an 87-yarder. The kid was just a human highlight reel, and I don't like to use that uh, very much because there's one person that has that, um, and that's Dominique Wilkins. But Bert well, Emanuel Jr. Hey, man. Hey, man, Bert. That's true. Yeah, now we can we can trademark it. We can share the trademark between the two. But it, I, I don't typically watch – central michigan that closely i will i will be completely honest on that Uh, however when when he came on the football field he was just must watch tv it didn't matter what day of the week it was i mean the guy plays his best football on the on the weekdays because that was when they were playing he's never played on a saturday in college football before like the dude just plays during the week that that's just it's it's weekday bird that's what we got to start calling him because he's un, unbeaten when it comes to going off on Wednesdays and Fridays. I mean, weekday he's just, Bert, that just sounds like a segment that Sesame Street would do. That's a good point. Maybe that's who he's named after or his dad is. I don't know. That's another story for another day. Maybe we can ask him. Anywho, Bert Emanuel Jr., man, remember the name. If he gets that starting job, I'm really excited to see what his potential is as a passer. Um, again, like we said, has a lot to prove. I haven't really been able to see it. I've heard really good things from the scrimmages uh, during spring practice so far. Uh, He's just an athlete, man. He is absolutely electric. 6'3", 210, really good size as well. Has a good arm. Uh, Just we need to see him in game action throwing the football. But running the football, we know they're going to have that, um, you know, they're going to have that element to their game. And he's going to be unstoppable. He might go for 1,200 yards this year on the ground. I actually thought of another player that I need to need to need to nominate for this because I need him on the graphic that we're gonna have, so I have to bring him up. And you could guess who? It's a group of five player. There's your hint. There's your hint. It's not on the West Coast. It's not a Maryland okay. best player. Is it Braylon Braxton? Nope. Oh dang! Uh, give me a conference. <sighs> Fun. No, 
Um, is it uh, Rasheen Ali? Nope. Six foot, 175 pounds of pure, um, really good football player. 13 the games most, last so year. So my man went like this, and then it just... <laughs> <laughs> he had 49 catches, 789 yards, six touchdowns, that's 16.1 yards per grab. Added 20 rushes for 187 yards and a touchdown. You might know who it is now. I'm not even going to really dive into it. I'm just going to say he's the best receiver in the fun belt. He's going to erupt like uh, a volcano. Let me look up famous volcano. Most yeah, famous volcano. Well, I want to go with Kilauea. That. That's why I was even going to say perfect. Mount Vesuvius. He's going to erupt this year like Mount Vesuvius. I just needed to make sure that it was one of the premier volcanoes on our planet, which it is. It's a Sama Strato volcano located on the Gulf of Naples in okay. Campania, Italy. So, yes, wow. he's going to erupt like Mount Vesuvius. That's high praise if you know about the Mount. It's Jared Brown. I gave you a lot of time to figure it out. It's Jared Brown, Coastal Carolina. He'll be the best receiver in the Sun Belt this year, the fun belt. His game is fun. One word to describe his game is, okay, I just came up with like 13 different words at the same time. I'm going to go with race car because that's how fast he is. End of it. Are just all Italians who uh, were offended by his I'm assuming mispronunciation. That didn't sound right when you were telling where that mountain was, uh, volcano was located. It just didn't sound right. I can't confirm or deny whether it was pronounced correctly, but it sounded rough. That's all I can tell you. What you said Vesuvius correctly, but I didn't catch what you said after that. It's a Soma Strato volcano located on the Gulf of Naples in Campania, Italy. Okay. Oh, I guess we'll we'll see your feedback. I guess we'll find out. I I have no Italian heritage, so I, I'm not one to ask whether that was correct or not. But I guess we'll mm. find out. Y'all can tell Liam and yeah. On on September 27th, 2020, it looks like this website who I won't name because we're not sponsored by this website did a, a a list of the 16 most famous volcanoes in the world. Mount Vesuvius, number one. Jared Brown, number one. Fiji absolutely snubbed. I like Mount Fiji. Maybe I should have said that. Well, now we're talking about volcanoes. What? How? What have we become? I don't know. Good luck topping that, though. That's where I'm at. I, that's where I end. I'm out. Jared Brown, Sayo Ladipo, Devontae Walker, Zach Hines, Justin Wally, and the 19 members of Boise State that I talked about. Well, Which, what's sad? Sorry, what's sad? I didn't even finish uh, naming all the Boise State guys. Oh, I'm sure you didn't. Oh, I'm absolutely sure you didn't. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the running back uh, that I'm I'm extremely excited about uh, for my last one. I'm gonna go to Marcus Carroll at Georgia State. I am super duper excited to see the run game continue in Georgia State after Tucker Gregg and Jamias Williams are headed out. Marcus Carroll can be just as good, if not better. Sean Elliott, the head coach there, was talking to me about him over the phone while we were previewing his team for the magazine. Who is super excited about what Marcus Carroll can bring. 5'10", 205, really strong physical running back. Uh, again, yards after the carry, not going to be a problem. 4.8 yards per carry, uh, 594, six touchdowns. Really talented kid, but again, was you know kind of the third string guy behind some really talented running backs. And now he's number one, just like that. And he's going to have an experienced offensive line to run behind. Uh, it's going to be a really fun offense to watch for Georgia State. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see the growth of Darren Granger, Jakari Carter, the transfer receiver. Uh, it, man, Sean Elliott could not stop talking about Jakari Carter, man. He's going to be another guy to watch at wide receiver. Um, at Merrimack, I believe, was where he transferred from. Smaller guy, 5'9", about 160 pounds. But did he, at Georgia did State. He, did, he com- did he compete with Tavarius and the King Merrimack College? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I knew that there was a chance that that reference went completely past you. Champion. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Champion. Totally missed it. I'm sorry. Yep. But invest in both Jakari Carter and Marcus Carroll. That's all I'll say. Georgia State's going to be fun to watch. Also in the fun belt. Yep. 
Anything else, Mr. Liam, about Boise State or anybody that you'd like to include in this conversation? Well, Any I other mean, volcanoes? Uh, no, but I mean, Boise State, yeah, like Palin Green, that's a good ball player, ain't he? It's going to be fun to watch him and Bert Emanuel just run the rock. Um, okay, there actually, there's another player on Boise State, but I'm blanking on his name, plays cornerback. You could talk a little like by his name. Um, I did see a report today that Jarquez Hunter is the best running back that Hugh Freeze has ever coached. And so I'm excited to see what Jarquez Hunter can do. Apparently he had a really good A day, as they call it, Auburn spring game. So I'm excited to see what he can do replacing Tank Bigsby. Yep. Gotta love the, the A day. <laughs> But where they tied, by the way, and they said the winners were getting steak and that the losers were getting hot dogs and they tied, which I just feel like then nobody eats. Nobody eats in a tie. Yeah. That should be like a like a slogan, like a on a billboard in every team's locker room. Nobody eats in a tie. Yeah. You can't even tie in college football, but it, it still stands. Yes. Um, okay. The other boys state player that I want to point out is a cornerback. I need to get his name out there because I don't think I had like any room to fit him in for the Boise State preview because that team is that deep and loaded with talent. It's a Laney College transfer. He's from uh Palo Alto, East Palo uh, East Palo Alto. It's a Marion McCoy plays cornerback, six foot one seventy. He is another guy that just popped off in their spring game. And there's a reason to be so confident in Boise State this year, especially in the secondary, even though they've lost so much, because that secondary is deeper than NFL team secondaries. I, I mean, they have dudes everywhere, and they are going to just absolutely thrive. McCoy's a, a two sport athlete. He plays basketball as well. Uh, yeah, what, what do you do? Um, he had uh, four interceptions and four pass breakups in 2022 at Laney. Uh, yeah, he's a good football player. He's actually cousins. Oh, cool. This is cool. He has six cousins that play collegiate or professional football. One is Jordan Mims. Oh, wow. Another one's Nation Wright. About that, yes. what a family! So he he's he's next up, uh, and yeah, Mario McCoy's really good. He's gonna just find himself on the field like Boise State is ridiculous. Woo, yeah. And Rodney Robinson's coming back too, isn't he? At safety, yeah. It's like they are so deep. Yeah, man. I mean, Geo Skinner. Mark like... Reed's gonna be back. He had a season-ending injury uh, in the Oregon State game. Like we said, JL Skinner was like a superstar back there, but now they just got, you know, stars by committee, it feels like. Uh, yes. in the second and, they, so. and Boise State has a type. It's athletic, tough, versatile freaks. Basically, they've got a bunch of – basically, they, they uh, take after the Seahawks, it just feels like. And they've got a bunch of just – Athletic, raw freaks, wannabe cam chancellors running around and dudes hard, making incredible pass breakups, keeping quarterbacks up at night, having nightmares, can't sleep. I feel like there's got to be a a nickname for their secondary that we got to create. That's something along the lines of Legion of Boom. We we gotta we gotta come up with something for the secondary. Uh, I, uh, Legion of Spuds. I was thinking of something with potatoes. Doom. Doom? Yeah, but I don't know. Because I don't know if you know this. It rhymes with boom. That is true. Can't confirm, uh, actually. See, but like Boise's Doom just sounds lame. Well, we'll work yeah. on that. We'll workshop that. Put it in the magazine. Give something give something for people to look forward to in the magazine among everything else but if ooh. nothing else just that oh my god a good oh. one ooh, let's hear. this could be so bad <laughs> it's so bad never mind That's no we have to hear it 
<laughs> no, okay. we have to hear it. I thought I thought that this was like kind of a menacing thing, which that's like put the counter up on the screen. That's like the twelfth time that we said menace or menacing. We're Thirteen now. I thought that this was like a menacing fourteen thing, and it's just not at all. Uh, my thought was like because because the keeping quarterbacks up at night, awake, they can't sleep, nightmares, night crawlers. <laughs> it's just an earthworm. <laughs> I don't hate that though. I honestly don't. I don't think I it's that bad. It was so much more like lethal. It's just night crawlers. You look it up. Call them an earthworm. <laughs> Isn't there like a Marvel or DC character named that? I'm probably pissing I off a know. lot of yeah. Well, Marvel, you lost DC me there because right I don't know. They're probably more mad at me for not knowing anything about that world. It, it sounds like a superhero thing. Some people consider nightcrawlers to be a significant pest for outcompeting native worms. Okay. Yeah. Now it doesn't sound as good. Now you you when you search when you Google nightcrawlers, the first thing that comes up is a University of Minnesota article. Well, go first. Yeah, so that's why Andrew started working on. Yeah. <laughs> that's what. Uh, yeah. Mind. I won't say it. Yeah, I guess um, like Nightcrawlers just ain't it. That was that was not. It sounded than, cool though until I looked up than, what they were. And it's remember. better than Legion of Spuds. I feel like there's something with like potatoes that we could mm-hmm. use because Boise in Idaho, but that's not menacing. It's got to be menacing. Potatoes aren't menacing, as far as I know. I, I don't live in Idaho, so maybe that's there's a different vibe over there. The, I, don't, I don't know what I just Their said. secondary is so loaded potatoes. <laughs> the mashed don't, potatoes. No. If they were a Mac team, they could have been the Mac the potatoes. What? No. That was a million times worse than Nightcrawlers. <laughs> that was so much worse. I think we need to wrap this this up. <laughs> I, I, we need to think of something good, though. It, Monsters, yeah, Inc. <laughs> not sponsored by Pixar right. or Nightcrawlers or Mount Vesuvius. Nope. We got to We got to find something. That's yeah. that's a must. Dude, Goal number Inc. one. Cool. That would be cool. Broncos Shop. Inc. Broncos Inc. We'll work on that. Welcome to the scare zone. Dump them, dump them. Right. The scare floor. I don't know. There's something there. We're working yes. towards it. And say Oladipo is Mike Wazowski. It feels offensive to, oh, wow. to Oladipo. Mike Wazowski's the best. Yeah, but he's not scary. That was the whole point of Monsters he's University. So Did you see that scary. Movie? He's so scary. He's so scary. Anyway, we're we Jalen Clark. I don't think solely. we've ever gone more off track. Jalen Clark is solely in the opposed opposing quarterbacks are boot. All right, we'll, we'll work on that. We'll get some feedback on it. Work on that. Get some, you know, we'll work towards that. We'll find something. There's something there. There's promise for sure. But anywho, if you enjoyed whatever the hell this was for an hour, please give us a five star rating on Spotify, Apple, Woo-hoo. like on YouTube. Like I said earlier in the episode, we talked a lot about the magazine at the start, which feels like eons ago now because we talked about mm-hmm. volcanoes and Monsters Inc. for a while. Um, if you have any ideas for stories, players we should interview, coaches we should interview, any stories that are worthy of being told on our platform, please let us know. I'm open to hearing anything um, that you've got in mind. So, of course, feel free to comment, like, share with your friends. Um, and then we hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you next Wednesday for our next episode of the Transfer Portal CFB podcast. Yes, see ya. I've been holding on the top sticks for an hour. <laughs> <laughs>